Every problem in the kingdom is a love problem. Every problem in the kingdom is a love problem. Every problem that you see on this planet is, is a love problem. When, when you have the love of God in your heart, that's, that's the catalyst. That's, that's where things change. That's, the love of God is the catalyst. We, we get saved and we think we're done with knowing and growing and receiving more of God's love. And, and you're not. Um, pastoring is a trip because you feel people's burdens you sense people's burdens, and then other people try to project their burdens onto you. Say amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not yours. It's not yours. Say it. Go ahead and say it. It's not yours. You're going to participate or get out. You're going to participate or get out. What you come for if you're not going to participate? I will. I'm the kicking out pastor. I will kick you out. I'm a former referee. I give up technicals quick, quick. So people think they know by your body language or your facial expression, what you're feeling and what you're thinking. <laughs> and I'm an, when, some, when I get a message in my brain, I get intense. And so sometimes on Sunday morning, I'm not the smiley face DJ. People come to me, everything all right, Pastor? You're doing all right. Everything okay? There, there's very little that dis distracts me from preaching the, the gospel, right? And so um, my burden this morning is I was talking to Robin Coates a little bit about it. My burden this morning is um, there's, there's a group of you in here that have done some living. Your hair has changed colors since high school. <laughs> some have no hair to change color anymore. And the high school you, the high school senior you was ready for new things. Ho, ho. I'm leaving Cherryville. I'm leaving Neodice. I'm moving up out of here. I'm going to be. And we reach a point in our lives and our Christianity where there's no new things. You get your resume out and you go to church meetings. I've been doing this for 34 years. and I know what God is doing. I, I've been to conference after conference, and I've seen God, da, 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 and I've done this. I, I'm, I know what I'm doing. I just don't want to live like that. I want to wake up going, God, if there's a new thing I haven't seen before, doggone it, do it. I want to see it. I want to know it. I want to experience it, and I want to be like, wow, when it happens. I don't want to be like, I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. You, you ruin it for everybody, by the way. Can, can that person that knew Connecticut was going to lose last night, you're a liar, and I don't believe you. You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. I knew it. I knew they were going to lose. I knew it. I, I, I've been saying that. I told everybody. It's like, there are some, <laughs> Mr. Calhoun just got it, I guess. <laughs> There are some new things that God wants to do with you and with us. And some of you don't have your same high school haircut and you need to be ready for something new. All right? Say amen one more time. Make sure we're on the same page. If you're a visitor here, I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to First Baptist Church right now. But it's so easy. So last night I went to FCA conference and I mean... You know, you show up, you preach, you're out the door. It's all good. And I saw God do some stuff last night I ain't never seen before. And I was just driving home like, man, how quick we're just to think we got it figured out. I mean, we think we got this thing figured out. And Jeremiah 29, I, I can't imagine what they were thinking. We're going to read a few verses here. First verse, and we're going to stay in this same vein. Amen. I'm going to give you time to find it. Oh, he's got it up there, so we can just go right to it. It says, Jeremiah wrote a letter. So he's writing a letter here, uh, which is very interesting to me. He's writing it to people who have been taken captive, depending on what commentary you look at, anywhere between 2,000, 3,000 miles to a new place. They don't speak the same language as them, whole different culture, whole different way of doing things. And Jeremiah is a prophet of God, and he's writing these people to encourage them about being in exile. Okay? This would be an email 
text message, maybe not a Snapchat. It's a little too long for Snapchat. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This was the, after King Jerichim, the queen mother, the court officials, the other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen and artisans had been deported from Jerusalem. And it's kind of letting us know they took the, the talented people first. <laughs> so if you're a carpenter in here or a, or a banker or an accountant or a doctor, you, you go first. <laughs> that's not funny, y'all. I think that's kind of funny. It's almost like... When you go to the pet store, you look for the good dog. You know, you try to figure out, no, I ain't the dog, no. He looks dumb, no, not him. I'm not good at that, by the way. I don't pick the good dog. Neither does my wife, but we won't talk about that now. <laughs> he sent the letter with Elisa, son of Shapen, and Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, when they went to Babylon as King Zedekiah's ambassadors to Nebuchadnezzar. This is what his letter said. So he's writing to people in exile. They've been taken captive by their enemies, by their haters, okay? They're in exile. They're slaves, okay? New customs, new language, new culture, new way of doing things. I just want you to use your imagination a little bit. No longer in Kansas, Toto, all right? This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives who he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Fifth verse. Build some homes. <laughs> Plan to stay. Hold on. When we go through difficulty, raise your hand if you, if, if you look forward to God saying, hey, stay here for a while. It's not. When you're in difficulty, you're like, get me out. Right? You don't say, I plan on staying. I like difficulty. I like adversity. You grow there. <laughs> I don't even like the adversity of traffic. We don't have traffic here, but we have four-way stops where people don't know what to do. <laughs> Driving for 50 years. The direct traffic guy at the four-way stop really bothers me. It's my pride. I know it is. Pray for me. He just sits there and directs traffic. You go, no, you go, no, you go. It's like, just go, dude. <laughs> traffic cop. <laughs> Sorry. A little rant there. It's just... When we get in difficulties, like, get me out, God. I can't take this. He says, I want you to, the sixth verse, well, he says, plant gardens and eat the food they produce. So he's being very practical here. Six, marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so they may have many grandchildren. He's like, grow. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I've sent you into exile. He says, I want you to work and make life better for your enemies that have taken you captive. <laughs> All you anti-Trump people, work for the betterment of your community. Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> That's anti. You cannot can't claim Jeremiah 29 11 and not accept these first three verses that come with it. You can't claim this as your verse and not accept this right here. He says, I want you to go improve the community. Post on Facebook about how smart you are and how dumb the president is. I don't see that on here. And those of you who are laughing, you just got through from eight years of doing that, so you shouldn't be laughing. It's like, this is what we're doing now. America is not your home, kingdom citizens. Heaven is. You're in Babylon right now. So your expectations of your Christian nation should be really low because this is Babylon. <laughs> it's not your home. Another culture, another language, another way of doing things. And those of you who thought because... We wrote a constitution and put God in it and said, in trust God, trust in God, we trust in our money. And those of you who thought that, that made that, this made this place not Babylon, bam, my heart breaks for you. My heart literally breaks. There's not one nation on this planet where there are not sinful people with sinful nature and far away from God. I don't care what the colors of your flag are. 
You're not an American citizen. First and foremost, you're a kingdom citizen born from above, a new way of talking, a new culture, and new principles, new values, new mission. Now, I rep my colors now. I'm American. I'll be the first one. I always tell my African Americans that y'all can go back to Africa. I'm staying right here. I'm on the dock. Like, all right, y'all. All right, chilling. All right, that's too bad. I'm not going. I'm American. But I want you to understand, America can pass away and God will still be there. The word of God will still be there. Oh, we're becoming socialists. You're supposed to be about the gospel. Ooh, that's half of y'all won't be here next week. That's all right. Half of y'all are done. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord for the place where your enemies have came and take you captive. For its welfare will determine your welfare. So if the city doesn't do good, we're not going to do good. If the city of Chanute does not do good, church, we're not going to do good. Hey, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army, the God of Earth says, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have sent, I have not sent them to the Lord. So the first thing you got to discern this morning is have I been sent by God or am I a fortune teller, magician, and trickster? That's the thing you have to discern this morning. That's the thing you have to discern this morning. Look at number 10. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. At a four-way stop for 70 years. <laughs> Lord, help us. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. Now look at 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. Some of you love this verse and you're already smiling, but if you're not practicing the first 10, this verse is a conditional promise. It's connected to the first 10. You cannot lift this scripture up, put it on your mirror, put it on a plaque. If you're not in the first 10, this promise does not apply to you. Some promises of God are unconditional. Some are conditional. This is a conditional promise. So if you're not practicing the first 10, please take down this plaque in your house, get on your knees, repent, hit the control alt delete button, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to what it means to do the first 10 verses so that 11th verse can be real in your house. Twelve. In those days when you pray, I will listen. He likes listening to people that bless those who persecute them. He loves to hear from people that pray for their enemies. He loves to hear from people that turn the other cheek. He loves to hear from other people that lay down their rights. He loves to hear from people that are peacemakers. He loves to hear from you. People that will practice and seek God's face about those qualities in the kingdom, you are the ones he wants to hear from. He doesn't care about titles, degrees, money, class, race. He says, is my spirit in you and are you going to bring heaven down to Babylon? I love to hear from you. Thirteen, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Fourteen, I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. Who's going to end your captivity and restore your fortunes? Not Facebook. The change in this nation is not coming through Facebook, kids. I'll tell them. I'm going to show them. Look, I found an article that backs up my point. Hmm. Then you go to work. Won't you come to church with me? No, thank you. No, thank you. You act just like me. Why would I go there? Oh, boy, I can tell. Ooh. Let's vote now, Rex. Let's vote now. This is awesome. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you. I'll bring you home again to your own land. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that's in your word. 
I pray that you would help your speaker now represent you well. I pray that your spirit would rest, rule, and abide in a way that is just so awesome that we know that you're here with us. And then I pray that we will respond to the truth that's being spoken this morning. Help us to know that our non-response is actually a response. We love you, Lord. And with Jesus, I pray, amen. He said, I want you to go build homes. He gave him some very practical application here. And I believe there's a truth that we can get underneath when he's talking about build your homes, plant gardens. When he starts telling them this very practical thing, there's a truth I want you to get underneath. And the first truth I want you to see this morning is God is saying, no matter if it's financial, no matter if it's circumstantial, no matter if it's relational, no matter if it's uncertainty, no matter if it's your health, God is saying, make the best of your situation. I know where I have you. I know where I got you. I know where you're at. I want you very practically to make the best of your situation. We live in a generation now, in a culture now, who thinks everything should be handed to them and everything should always be positive. And I want to work from 11 to 2 and be off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I need every holiday that there is, National Potato Day. I need that day off too. And it's like we do not no longer know how to make the best of a situation. In scripture, you got this young man named Joseph. He's put in a pit. He He's been put in slavery. He could feel sorry for himself. He could be writing letters to the governor. He could be doing all these things to protect himself and to get himself rescued. But he chooses to serve God while he's a slave. He ends up becoming the head slave. He ends up getting promoted all because he decided he was going to make the best of his situation. I don't mean to sound like Joel Osteen this morning, but there is a truth in this that a smile means something. Wake up in the morning, encourage yourself and say, I'm going to make the best of my situation. You may work at a workplace where they're as mean as hornets. You may feel overworked. You may feel underappreciated, but I believe if you wake up in the morning and pray and seek God's face, he'll give you a word about how to make the best of your situation. Amen? And I want to challenge you today to get up in the morning. The community needs you to wake up in the morning and make the best of your situation. This community is hurting right now, and we need to be the type of people that when we go into the workplace, when we go into meetings, we're going to make the best of the situation. Amen. I know it's difficult to have healing issues or, you know, I know what that's like to get those notices in the mail. First notice, second notice. Don't let me catch you on the street notice. You ever got that one before? I have. I see you on the street. Have you ever, you know, you talk to Sears on the phone and the person on the phone act like you, like you owe them money, you know? <laughs> they talk mean to you like you owe them money and you can get discouraged by your bills. You can get discouraged by your bank account. You can get discouraged by your kids or your grandkids. Life can be real discouraging, but he's saying, I know you're in Babylon. I know you're in exile. I know you're in this particular situation. Make the best of it. We have a lady that serves in the church over there on the other side. Her name is Marge Carlson. Marge Carlson's an older lady. I don't know how old she is, but she's an older lady. She doesn't get to do the ministry she used to do, but every birthday, every anniversary, she sends somebody in this church a card. If you join the church and you tell me you have a birthday, you tell us you have an adverse anniversary, anniversary, it goes in the system and she sends a card. She can't do a lot, but she can make the best of a situation and can, she can send a card out. There is something you can do right now with your limited knowledge. You may feel unqualified. You may feel not worthy, but God is saying, I know who you are. I made you. I created you. Make the best of it. Make the best of it. Make the best of it. Oh boy, but we'd rather throw that pity party. Isn't that fun? I'm the first overworked pastor of all time. No, no other pastor's ever been overworked like me. Isn't that how we want to behave? We want to behave like we're so unique, we're so special, our problems are so unique, so nobody's ever been where we've been. And I, I really to say probably if you start talking to somebody across the room, you take your little bitty problems back, <laughs> I'm sorry I said anything. You got to make the best of your situation. I don't know what that means practically for you. You see God's face about how to respond to that. But my prayer is when you wake up in the morning and go to work or go, or you wake up in the morning, you stay at home dad, you stay at home father, you wake up in the morning and you got your kids, you make the best of your situation. 
It's so difficult. We, we live in an age now where they're like, it's like every three days a computer goes obsolete. You know, it's like constantly new technology. I was seeing a study that was saying there's like, when you start college now, there's 10,000 new jobs that didn't exist when you started college. <laughs> so when you graduate, there's 10,000 new jobs that you weren't trained for to do. That's how fast the, the things are changing. And I can see, I get it now, if you start to get an older, how it seems like life is passing you by and, and old or older or whatever you want to call it. I know everybody gets offended, but some of y'all are just old. We don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I wish there was a polite way to say it, but old is old, Landon. It's just old. I don't know what to tell you. You know, God made the word, not me. I don't know what to tell you. you know? So it's like, but I get why it's discouraging because people just pass you by. I watch kids all the time out here in the commons that are when our, when our older people are coming in and they just run them over. Everybody's just passing you by. And you may feel like, you know what? Ministry's passing you by. No, it's not. Make the best of your situation. If you notice, he kind of goes down there and he's not done yet. He goes on, he says, I want you to make babies. I want you to multiply. I want you to have grandchildren. I want you to multiply. I want you to know something. I want you to understand the second principle this morning. First principle is make the best of your situation. Second principle is there's no circumstance, no situation where it's okay to be unfruitful. Not for citizens. That even in an exiled land, God is expecting his children to be fruitful. We're coming up on Easter, and we're coming up on uh, Holy Week, and we're going to be having Holy Week services here next week from starting on Sunday night to Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the main building. The whole community comes together, and we celebrate uh, Jesus Christ's resurrection all that. But we're coming up on Easter, and we're coming up on Holy Week, and if you look at Jesus on the cross, here he is having the worst day of anybody of all time. They call it Good Friday, but it was a really bad day. <laughs> He had the worst day of anybody of all time. And in the midst of having nails driven in his hands, nails driven in his feet, a crown of thorn placed on his head, spit on, mocked, ridiculed, laughed at, made fun of, in the midst of all of that, he is bringing somebody into the kingdom. He tells the guy on his right, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was fruitful even on the cross. He was having an infinitely worse day than you could ever have. And even on his infinitely worse day, he was bringing bringing somebody into the kingdom. He was fruitful. And I want to challenge you, if your circumstances are negative, if your finances are low, you can still be generous. With low finances, you can still be fruitful. Even if your relationships are off, that don't mean you close your off, yourself off from family. That don't mean you close yourself off from friends because your marriage is bad. You open yourself up to your family. You open yourself up to friends, even when relationships are bad, because you can still be fruitful even in your most negative situation you can see somebody else's suffering and encourage them. You can see somebody else's hurt and you can go to meet that need. And he says, I want you to be fruitful even when life is negative. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist. It doesn't matter what your belief is right now. You can get with this. I know there are atheists in the room. You can get with this right here. You can encourage somebody even on your bad day. He says, I want you to understand that it's not all about you, boo. It's not all about you, boo-boo. <laughs> Make the best of your situation. I want you to be an encourager. I want you to go out and be fruitful. But then he says, I want you to listen to real truth. That there are some fake preachers out there. There are some fake kingdom citizens amongst us. And they don't promote the truth about God. And if you're listening to them, they would have you to believe that this is going to end real fast. <laughs> All you got to do is name it and claim it and God will make a way for you. I dare you to say I'm healed. And you're going, <coughs> I can't even get the words out. <coughs> And there are these, this, this, this thing, this fake preaching that if you just show up for church and you just smile and you just sing the song, God is going to fix everything that's wrong in your life. Bang. There are some things in the kingdom that don't make sense. Trust God long enough, you will have to deal with uncertainty. Stay in the kingdom long enough, you will wonder what the Father is doing. You stay serving him enough, and you will get tired of his children. 
What'd you smile for, Arlen? <laughs> you stay here long enough, you're going to deal with stuff. You're in exile. You need to get around truth. You need to be listening to the word of God. You need to be in the word of God. You need to be trusting God with his word. You need to find somebody who knows the word of God and can go through the word of God with you. You need to get into a church where the word of God is promoted and the interpretation is accurate so you can love God with all that you got so that when you're in negativity, you can make the best of your situation. You can be an encourager. You can be fruitful even in a dry and weary land. And that takes truth. But he didn't stop there. He said, not only do I want you to uh, make the best of your situation, not only do I want you to be fruitful, not only do I want you to follow truth, I want you to be patient. He said, you're going to be here for 70 years. I don't want you to get caught up in the time because I don't know how long you're going to be dealing with your situation, but I want you to be patient. Romans 12, 14 tells us, be patient in trouble. Be patient in trouble. You need to be patient. Somebody told me, I don't believe in patience or I don't pray for patience. It doesn't matter if you pray for patience. You're going to have to learn it on this side of heaven because you don't get everything you want immediately when you want it, unfortunately. And sometimes... Thank God. On a very elementary note, when you're in high school, you think you know who you're in love with. You go to the class reunion, you go, thank God, God, that. <laughs> you go to the class reunion, you're like, woo, I dodged a couple of bullets there. I mean, sometimes we just know what we want. We just know what we want. Being patient with God. Now listen to me clearly as I close. You get tired. You get weary. It gets difficult. Sometimes you feel alone. And you think you want to quit. And you're in exile. And you've done everything you know to do. And just when you want to throw in the towel, God says, I know the plans I have for you. I know what I am doing. I have a plan for your life. I am God. I see all things. I know all things. I can do all things. I am concerned. I can sympathize. I can empathize with you. I am here with you. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. It may be dark. It may be destitute. I know the plans I have for you. And when you start wrestling with that, you start really doing kingdom business and you just want to please God with your life. You just want to love somebody who needs love. You just want to be there when somebody's suffering. You just want to be used by the Lord to encourage somebody. When you start becoming that type of person, when that becomes your heart, you just become so surrendered, you want to behave like Christ. This is where the power of prayer takes over and runs rampant in your life. James says the prayer of the righteous availeth much. The prayer of the righteous is special to God because they have the heart of God and they want what God wants in God with God's people and in these communities. And if we go out here and behave like Christ, stay surrendered and really care about this community, when we pray, it will be worth it and we will see God move like never before because we laid down our agendas, we laid down our resumes and turned our lives over to the one true God who can make things right. Now the cool thing is about this message is that even if you're a non-believer you can get behind this. You can hear what I'm saying this morning. Even if you're a Buddhist, you can get behind what I'm saying this morning that how we treat each other matters. I'm not asking you to believe what Muslims believe, but I'm asking you to treat them like Christ would treat them. 
And I'm challenging this church not to participate in hate. I do not agree with everything in this culture. I don't agree with every lifestyle in this culture, but I refuse to participate in hate. I want the prosperity of this community. Before you vote this morning, I'm talking to First Baptist Church, I want you to know I'm not even concerned. I am mostly concerned about the city of Chanute and his love being transmitted there. I did not come to play church with church people. I did not come to play church with church people. I did not come to fight over music on Sunday morning. I did not come to debate about doctrine. I did not come here. God did not send me here to make you feel good about yourself. I come to challenge us and myself every single Sunday for this to be the house of prayer, a place of encouragement, a place of hope. And if somebody wants to connect with the living hope, Jesus Christ, we would get out the way and allow them, no matter who they are and what they've done, come to the cross and cast their cares because he cares for them just like he cares for you. So I'm I'm not going to play church. I got cousins. I'll just move in with them. (laughs) Got all kinds of cousins around here. Will we be the people that will love? Not agree. Just love. Just love. Will we wake up transmitting love, seeking the hope of this city? Man, I I can see the hurt. Man, I I, I hug some of you. I can see the hurt on your faces. Your homes aren't well. I can see that some of you guys' marriages aren't well. It's it's one thing to be involved with kids and your own kids are out there. It's one thing to be praying for people and you need prayers answered. We got widows in our congregation. We got people who've lost their kids. There's all kinds of things going on here. And, and, And we're challenging you, man. We got different leaders. We faced it. If you're somebody here on the outside, I know what it feels like to feel unqualified and be on the outside. I am an amateur. I have no degrees. I have an associate's degree. That don't count to me. (laughs) I have nothing. All I know is Christ crucified. It's Christ who qualifies you. It's Christ who sets you right. We're going to say a prayer. And first I'm going to pray for somebody who maybe need to set things right with God. And we talked about this last week. I'm going to say it almost every single Sunday for a while. You know, you, you, when I was a kid one time, I, I went swimming after I ate, and I got a cramp and started drowning in the pool. And I went to the bottom of the pool. And I told you guys last week, I could see my friends looking down at me eating chips, but nobody was moving. You know, I'm down here drowning, and they up there eating Lay's, you know. I'm at the bottom of the pool, and I could feel myself blacking out. And the lifeguard jumped down into the pool, swam down, and came and yanked me out of that water. Now, I didn't need to have no CPR or nothing, you know. But maybe for the first time, you're starting to understand that, like me, you're at the bottom of the swimming pool, you're drowning, and your friends are just watching you drown, eating chips, drinking soda pop. A couple other people are yelling, swim. Maybe for the first time, you see this, that Jesus Christ is your lifeguard, and he dove down into the deep swam down to the bottom of the pool and yanked you out of that water and and did chest compressions and you were dead and he popped that water out of your lungs and gave you new life. That's what salvation is. That's the story of the gospel. That's the beauty of what happens on Easter. That's what he does for us. All right? I want to pray for you if that's becoming real to you right now. We can do an altar call and all that stuff, but you're no more saved if you come forth than if you say yes to Jesus in your seat. Amen? I know we have Baptist tradition here, but I believe that in your seat right now, if you say, Jesus, I believe you swam to the deep and came and got me and I was dead in my sin, you are now a child of God and in the body of Christ and have all the rights of any other kingdom citizen to serve him and represent him with your life. Amen? So I want to pray for a person that might be making that decision right now. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I'm praying for that person right now that's saying, okay, Lord, I'm recognizing that you have rescued me. You have just made me alive. Your Holy Spirit just turned the light on. I'm recognizing that, and I want to know what it means to surrender and serve you. I want to know what it means to love you. 
Lord, I pray for that heart right now that's made that decision. I pray that person will fall in love with your word. They will make their decision known to somebody today. They'll go up to somebody and say, man, I said that prayer in my heart today. I decided that, you know what? Jesus rescued me. That makes sense to me. That's what my heart is feeling. I pray they will share those words with somebody today. Father God, I pray that they know that you love them and you love even the ones who, who, who are denying you right now, who refuse to make a decision. You love those people too. Lord, be with us as a church body as we go through transition. Be with us as we try to serve you and serve this community. We bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. Give us a passion for your kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray.